name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. If you have your Bible, would you turn with me to the book of Jude? By now, you're very familiar with this little one chapter, 25 verse book. Um, And today and next week, we're going to wrap up this series that we've been sharing with you over the past weeks. Let me say thank you to Daniel and to the staff and the and the worship team and everyone that helped with the service last week. We're glad to be back with you today after a beautiful family wedding last weekend, and we're thankful for the opportunity to be with you this morning. The book of Jude, our series, we're going to continue and conclude this week and next week, our series entitled, A Strategy for Uncertainty. A Strategy for Uncertainty. There's no question that we are living in a time of great uncertainty. There is medical uncertainty, political uncertainty, emotional uncertainty, um, financial uncertainty, and of course, even spiritual uncertainty. But there's also no question that God has a plan. God has principles in his word for us to not just survive, but to thrive even in times of uncertainty. Our big idea for the entire series has been this. We may not have certainty, but we can have clarity. We all agree that there are times we don't know 100% what to do, but God can still give us wisdom and peace and strength and help during those times of uncertainty. Each week we gave you a key word and a key strategy. Our first week, way back five weeks ago, we shared with you our first key word was realize. Say that with me. Realize. That's the strategy of spiritual perspective. Then we spent two weeks on our second key word from verses 3 to 11, stabilize. Say that with me. Stabilize. The strategy of spiritual priorities. Then we spent two weeks from verses uh, three, uh, 17 to 21, energize. Say that with me. Energize. That was the strategy of spiritual power. Now today, I'm going to give you the fourth key word and key strategy And that is from verse 22 and 23, and that is evangelize, evangelize, the strategy of spiritual purpose. So we have realize, stabilize, energize, and now evangelize, evangelize, the strategy of spiritual purpose. The word evangelize comes from a root word evangel, which means or speaks of a herald or a messenger of good news. A king would send out a herald to go through the land and trumpet good news. The word and the idea of spiritual purpose speaks of the reason God created us, the reason that we are here on this earth. So if you put the two ideas together, here's our fourth strategy for times of uncertainty. To commit our life to God's purpose for our life by choosing every day to be a messenger of the good news of Jesus Christ. Let me say that again because that's a mouthful, but it's important. A strategy for times of uncertainty is to commit our life to God's purpose for our life, choosing to be a messenger of the good news of Jesus Christ. How many will acknowledge that the world is full of bad news. And how many know the world needs good news? And how many know we have the best news? We have the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are here. We are called. God has birthed us and placed us on this earth that we might be messengers of good and not evil. That we would be messengers of love and not hate. We would be messengers of grace and not guilt. We would be messengers of peace and not fear. We would be messengers of hope and not despair. We would be messengers of healing and not pain. We would be messengers of salvation, not condemnation, because he came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. How many know that a time of uncertainty is a great time of opportunity? If there was ever a time when the church needs to step up 
If there was ever a time when we need to realize we have a great opportunity, there are people out there and there are so many people today that are struggling and need hope and need peace and need to find Jesus and and are looking for answers. And we have the answer. We have the hope in Jesus Christ. And it's time for us to be heralds, to be messengers of the good news of Jesus Christ. It's a great opportunity to impact lives for Jesus. Robert Morris, a pastor in Texas, recently said this, there is one reason you are here. It's because to bring someone to heaven with you. How many know that's why we're still here? Because God wants us to bring someone to heaven with us. Let's look at our text, verse 22 and verse 23 of Jude. And we're going to read the text, and I want to talk to you about a couple of important points and principles this morning as we consider evangelize the strategy of spiritual purpose. Some with compassion making a difference. Then verse 23, others with fear pulling them out of the fire, a literal hell, hating the garments, that is the outer actions, not the person, but the actions, spotted by the flesh or sin. There's a story of a man walking down the street one night, and he comes across an alarming scene. He sees a home entirely in the back portion engulfed with flames. Looking through the front window, he sees a young family eating and having a fun family night, completely unaware of what was happening to their home. What should he do? He could interrupt them and tell them about what was going on in their home and help them out of the fire. Or he could walk by because he didn't want to interrupt them and interrupt their family night. Now, we would look at this scene, and if we walked by, we would say, well, of course he would interrupt them. Of course he would alert them. Of course he would help them out of the fire. Isn't that really a picture for us of the world that we're living in and us being messengers of the good news of Jesus Christ. We pass people every day that are lost and headed for fire and for hell. There are people that need a hope of heaven, a real place. And many times we say, well, I don't want to interrupt. I don't want to offend. I don't, I don't, I don't want to be rejected. I don't, I'm, I'm a little tentative. I don't know. They're going to label me one of those, you know, kinds of people. But we need to realize that God has us here, and the purpose that we're still here is to be messengers of the good news of Jesus Christ. Some with compassion making a difference, others with fear pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments, the outer actions stained with sin. We don't hate the sinner, we love the sinner, but we hate the sin, and we have to realize that we can bring hope and good news to Jesus Christ. Let me ask two questions this morning as we consider these two verses, important verses in Jude. First of all, what does it mean to evangelize? What does it mean to evangelize? The moment I mention that word evangelize today or evangelism, how many know it conjures up different ideas in our minds? For some, we immediately think of person going door to door, passing out, a Bible, or perhaps talking about God. Maybe we think of evangelize as a person handing out a track. Or maybe we think of evangelize as a person standing on a street corner preaching. Or maybe it's someone going on a missions trip to another country where they haven't heard about Jesus. Now, how many know all of those are evangelism? All of those are missions. All of those are great opportunities to be a messenger of the good news of Jesus Christ. But how many know for most of us, That's not where we live, and that's not what God has called us to be. But how many know we can still be messengers of Jesus Christ? We can still be evangels, heralds. We can still evangelize and fulfill the purpose that God has us here on earth. So what does it mean to evangelize? Well, Jude gives us a very important and simple definition in verse 22. Notice what he says, some with compassion, and note these three words, making a difference. Making a difference. Evangelize simply means make a difference wherever you are 
and wherever God has placed you. Making a difference. You see, our life, making a difference in someone else's life, is what it means to evangelize. We don't have to go to a mission field to evangelize. We don't have to stand on a street corner to evangelize. We can, and those are wonderful. And thank God for those who can do those things. We don't have to always be passing out a track or always uh, be preaching on a street corner, but what, going door to door. But what we can do is make a difference where God has called us and placed us. Where we live, where we work, everywhere we go. We can make a difference in someone's life with the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what evangelize means, making a difference. You know, years ago, must have been at least 25 years ago, I was at a leadership conference, and the speaker spoke about every person and every leader should have a personal mission statement. We always know that businesses or corporations, even churches, have a mission statement, a simple one-sentence statement that summarizes who they are, why they exist, and what their purpose is. And I took that to heart that day, and I spent that weekend at this conference, and I worked on a sentence that would be a mission statement for my life, that I could purposely get up every day with that focus, knowing that that's what God would want me to do. And this is what I came up with many years ago. I try to live by it every day. And it's this, making the most of every day and making a difference every day. Making the most of every day and making a difference every day. I gotta tell you, I get up every day and that is my goal, that is my purpose. That somewhere along the line in this day, I'm gonna meet someone or along this way, I'm gonna make a difference in someone's life in a small way. And I'm gonna make the most of that day. Because how many know we only have today, today, that's it. And we only have so many opportunities to make a difference. And as believers, we need to realize this is a wonderful time of opportunity to evangelize and to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to people's life. I got to tell you, I pray every day, Lord, bring someone into my path today. Lord, allow me to go to a place or wherever I go, whether it's a grocery store or walk the dog or wherever we are, that in some way I can smile or plant a seed or encourage someone or show them Jesus in some small way that could make a difference in their life. I would hope that every one of us would want our life to matter when it's all said and done. I would trust that every one of us would want our life to make a difference. You know what? When it's all said and done, I want people to say about my life, it mattered that he was born. It mattered that he lived. You know, at my funeral, I hope that people will not just say, oh, he was a good pastor, hopefully, and he was a good preacher or whatever. I hope people will say, he made a difference in my life. Back this day or this time, he said this or did this or encouraged this. I would, that's what I want it to be said that my life made a difference somehow in some small way that really is a big way because every seed is planted and God waters and brings increase for a harvest of the kingdom of heaven. You see, evangelism is not arguing and attacking people who disagree with us. How many know that? That's not evangelism. Evangelism is not convincing people we're right and they're wrong. Evangelism is not even getting people to believe everything we believe. Come on, somebody say amen. Evangelism is not our responsibility to change everybody's mind and change everybody's life. How many know evangelism is us showing Jesus and sharing Jesus and letting Jesus change people's minds and change people's lives? We are seed sowers. We are those that are to plant good seed as the parable of the sower Jesus taught in Mark 4, that we are to sow good seed in good soil. We are to look for opportunities to plant a good word and a good season and, and to touch people's lives with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, evangelism 
means or to evangelize means what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 13 to 16. Evangelize is to be salt and light in a dark and down world. Seasoning, that's what salt does. Seasons makes the world flavor a little bit better and tastier. And shining as a light in the midst of darkness. Evangelize means what, Matthew, what Jesus said in Matthew 9 and verse 35 to 38. Going to be laborers in the harvest field. Helping the weak. Hope for the weary. Healing of the hurting. Evangelize means what Jesus said in Matthew 25 and verse 36 to 46. He says, doing unto others as we would do it unto him. Feeding the hungry, clothing the naked. Visiting the sick and those that are in prison. Evangelize is sowing good seed and good soil. Sharing the word of God to hearts that are open and receptive. Can I ask us today, do we want our life to matter? Do we want our life to be better? Do we want our life to have meaning and fulfillment? Do we want our life to be filled with peace, joy, and hope? How many know nothing makes you feel better than when you help somebody else? Nothing else will bless you and help you in a time of uncertainty and make the world better than us sowing good seed and being messengers and heralds of the good news of Jesus Christ. Then let's commit our life today to the purpose of our life. And that is making a difference with our life. Every one of us can make a difference wherever we are and wherever God has placed us. You will be able to reach people I will never, ever get to preach to. You will meet people and encounter people that I'll never get to meet. But God has placed you there to be that herald, to be that messenger of the good news of Jesus Christ. So secondly, let's look at not only what does it mean to evangelize, but secondly, how are we to evangelize? How many know that's the tough part, isn't it? It's hard to evangelize. It's hard to share our faith and to share the good news of Jesus in this world that we're living in. It's difficult. And sometimes we don't always feel comfortable. Sometimes we feel fearful. Oftentimes we're worried about what people will say and do. But Jude gives us two ways and gives us two different approaches on how to evangelize and how to make a difference. He says in verse 22 and 23, some with compassion, others with fear. Think about it. Some with compassion, others with fear. What's he talking about? He's saying some with compassion, meaning be like Jesus, that is be merciful with extra kindness. On the other hand, he said, others, be like Jesus, be merciful with a little extra boldness. How many know there are some people who need and will only respond to compassion? And how many know there's other people who need and will only respond to fear? And as in one who is going to evangelize, we have to realize there are two different approaches and two different ways that we are to share and be messengers of the good news of Jesus Christ. You see, some people just need a little extra kindness. Others need a little more boldness. Have you ever encountered someone where you just knew this person was honest and sincere and they were just struggling with something or they were doubting something and you knew just a little extra kindness and compassion would steer them in the right direction. And then there are others who you you don't argue with but you still need to be bold and stand up for what you believe. Some with compassion making a difference, others with fear. Jesus taught that in Matthew 10, 16. When he sent the 70 out, He said this, I'm sending you as sheep among wolves. And that's what it feels like to evangelize. We feel like a sheep who's going to get swallowed up by wolves. 
We feel like we're going to get attacked and we feel like we're going to be on the defensive and we're going to be labeled and we're going to be criticized. But he says, I'm going to send you out. And this is what he says. There's going to, you got to have two approaches. On one hand, you got, there are times when you're going to need to be as gentle and harmless as a dove. Compassion. On the other hand, there's going to be times you're going to need to be wise and bold as a serpent. Fear. Boldness. You see the difference? Jesus taught that. And then not only did Jesus teach that, how many know Jesus modeled that? If you look at Mark 19, I mean Matthew 19, Matthew 19 is a great passage study in how Jesus handled people. In the first verses of 13 to 15 of Matthew 19, Jesus, a child is brought to him, and you know what he does? He puts the child on his lap, tenderly touches the child, prays for the child, and then he says, everyone should be like a little child to enter the kingdom of heaven. That was one way he approached people and evangelized. On the other hand, in the very next verses, verses 16 to 23, in the very next day, a rich young ruler comes to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? How many know he didn't put him on his lap, put his hand on him and pray for him? And he didn't tell him, be like this rich young ruler. You know what he did? He, he immediately questioned him and said, Who's good and what is good? And then he challenged him. Keep my commandments. And then he required of him. You want to enter the kingdom of heaven? Sell everything you have. You see, Jesus, some with compassion, making a difference. Others with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating the garments stained with sin. Let me... Matthew 21 is the same example, same thing about Jesus. Matthew 21, Jesus walks into the temple. And in the same temple, in one part of the building and the other part of the building, there are two different scenes. One part of the building, they're praising God, and there are people praying, lame people that are looking for prayer to be healed. On the other part of the building, there are money changers who are manipulating and taking advantage of people with money. And in the same place, the same location, Jesus walked into the same place, and he did two different things. With the ones who were praising him and wanted prayer for the lame, he blessed those that were praising him, and he healed those that were lame. On the other scene, he threw the money table, he told, threw the tables over and threw the money changers out. Some with compassion, making a difference. Some with fear, snatching them, pulling them out of the fire, hating the garment stained with sin. How many of you are parents here today? Let me see your hand. Those of you that are online that are parents, and what about, how many of you have more than one child? Okay, those of you that are online who have more than one. How many know as a parent you've probably learned, and if you haven't, you need to learn, while you love them both the same, you have to treat them differently? How many figured that out? Some with compassion, making a difference. Others with fear. How many know you approach one child a certain way? They react and respond differently. You approach the other child a certain way, they could react and respond. You have to know the person. That's what Jesus is teaching. That's what Jude is showing us. When you evangelize, you've got to know the soil. Isn't that what the parable of the sower? You've got to know the different kinds of soil. You've got to know there's some people who are hard. There are some people who, who are crowded and, and, and doubters. You have some people who, who, who are shallow ground. They're not deep with those things. And there are others who are good soil. And as a one who wants to be a messenger of good news, we've got to look for good soil and plant good seed. And it doesn't mean we don't respect and love all people. It doesn't mean we're not kind to all people. Just that some people need a little extra kindness. And some people need a little extra boldness in order to make a difference in their life. You see, Jesus approached different people, and we're going to meet different people. And this, let me paraphrase verses 22 and 23 this way in light of what we've just shared. Some who have innocent hearts like little children... Maybe they doubt, maybe they don't know, maybe they've never been taught, maybe no one's ever shared it with them. Those are the people with innocent hearts that you want to have great compassion and tenderness and kindness with. And then he says, on the other hand, others with fear, those who have arrogant hearts, you might need to be a little bolder and a little stronger to stand up for your faith and to share Jesus with them. But either way, we make a difference, either with compassion or with fear. 1 Peter 3.15 is, I believe, the best 
scripture and verse on how to evangelize. 1 Peter 3.15 says this. First of all, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. In other words, you need to settle the truth of Jesus Christ in your own life first. How many know we can't give away what we don't have ourselves? We can't share the gift and the good news of Jesus if we haven't experienced it ourselves first. So he says, sanctify or set apart or settle in your own heart the good news and the hope of Jesus Christ in your life. Then he says this, then be ready always, whether you're in Costco or whether you're in uh, whether you're walking your dog or whether you're at school or whether you're at home or whether you're at work, be ready always to give a reason for the hope that's in you. Don't walk around with a placard necessarily and you don't have to carry a big Bible. And, and, but what you can do is share with them the reason for the hope that's in you. In other words, tell them your story. Tell them why you love Jesus. Tell them why you go to church. Tell them why you believe in Jesus. Tell them your story. Listen, people may reject the Bible. They may reject scriptures. They may reject uh, even Jesus. But they may not even agree with things. But how many know if you tell them your story, they can't argue with your story. They could not agree with it. They may not embrace it. But how many know they can't argue with your story because it's your story? Tell them your story. Don't tell them about Pastor Farina. Don't tell them about a religion. Don't tell them, you know what? Tell them your story. Tell them who Jesus is to you, what he means to you, what he's done for you. Give them the reason for the hope that's in you. They need to know it works personally in their life, not just 2,000 years ago. Give them the reason for the hope. When didn't you listen? He goes on to say, with meekness and f- compassion and fear, extra kindness, and extra, you know, that's the recipe to evangelize. Extra kindness with extra boldness. That was Jesus' method. That was what Jesus taught, and that's how we can make a difference in other people's lives. Here's the bottom line today. The world will be better when we help make it better. Let me say that again. The world will be better, not by blaming the world or criticizing the world, arguing with the world, but by helping make the world a better place. I'm going to make two statements. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to acknowledge. But which one best describes your heart today? On one hand, I can't wait to get out of this big, bad old world. Or I can't wait to do something to make this world better. There's a lot of Christians who want to evacuate. When Jesus said, occupy till I come. Oh, I'm going to hide in my pew. I'm going to hide behind my church walls. I'm going to hide behind my private Christianity. No one's going to know what I believe. No one's going to know. I'm not going to get criticized. I'm not going to be labeled one of those weirdos. Uh, I'm... And then one day I'm going to get out of this big bag. I'm going to escape and go to a heaven and it's wonderful. Yeah, one day we will. But you know what? How about we make the world a little better while we're here? We should, can't wait every day to say, how can I make a difference today? How can I make the world a little better? My smile, my helping hand, my, uh, my good word, my prayer, my encouragement, me holding a door for someone. Come on. Little things that can make a difference and show people who Jesus is and what Jesus is all about can't wait to get out of this big bad old world or I can't wait to make a difference and make this world better in John 4 verses 34 to 38 Jesus said these powerful words my meat my food what I live for what gives me nourishment and strength every day is to do the will of him who sent me 
and to finish his work. How many know we're here to do the will of God and to finish the work that Jesus started? And he says this, don't say in four months the harvest. Come on, now is the time of the harvest. Now, in this uncertainty, is now is the opportunity. Don't say four months and then the harvest. Lift up your eyes, Jesus said. Look on the fields. Look out over your neighborhood. Look out over your workplace. Look out over where we go and what we do. The field is ripe unto harvest. And he told us that we are to go and reap what we don't eat, what we didn't even sow. Jesus already gave his life. He's already given us the power of the Holy Spirit. He's enabled us. He's positioned us and placed us where we are in this generation at this time and where he's put us for this hour to make a difference, to point people to Jesus and to bring somebody to heaven with us. I want to tell you a story in closing. Dr. Lloyd Ogilvie used to be a chaplain at the United States Senate, also a pastor for many years wrote a book called Another, The Other Jesus. In the particular chapter called Where Are Your Fish, he tells this story. I'm going to just read it because I want you to hear this story that he writes because it's so powerful. Listen to what Dr. Lloyd Ogilby says. He says, my wife Mary Jane and I were on vacation for a week at a fly fishing lodge. We enjoyed spending our days fishing and our evenings with other guests over dinner and around the fire. We would all brag about our favorite flies and swap exaggerated fishing stories. For a whole week, we lived and talked fishing. One of the guests I met that week, his name was Tom. Tom was the best equipped fisherman I ever met. His tackle box was filled with hundreds of exotic flies, and his fishing, he had fishing poles and reels of all sizes and weights. He was an enthusiastic participant in the evening conversations about fishing. Tom really looked, acted, and talked like a fisherman. We also learned that he spent a whole month every year at this particular lodge. During that week, however, we noticed that Tom never went fishing. Finally, my curiosity got the best of me, and one evening I asked Tom why he spent a vacation at a fishing lodge and never went fishing. He said, I'll never forget his answer. Oh, I used to go fishing, said Tom, but lately I just come here to relax and be with the guests. Fishermen are the finest people in the world. I enjoy talking with them, hanging around with them, and hearing their stories about fish. And one of these days, who knows? I'll probably go back to the river and fish. Here was a fisherman who didn't fish. As I thought, I decided there is no way we could really call Tom a fisherman. My meeting Tom, the fisherman who didn't fish, had given me a contemporary parable. Christ has called all of us to be fishers of men, and yet few have ever caught a fish. And far too many churches are like a fishing lodge where nobody fishes. We preach, we sing, we have activities about fishing, we talk about fish, but few have ever caught a fish. I don't know about you, but that challenged me. I hope it challenges you and us. I don't want to be a fisherman who never fishes. I don't want this church to be a fishing lodge where we never fish or catch fish. God has called us. God has created us. God has placed us here on this earth to be messengers of good news, to be fishers of men. And I want to challenge you as I challenge myself that if every one of us this week would make a difference in someone's life, the world would be just a little bit better. And just think about if every Christian around the world, instead of arguing and complaining and fighting and fussing, if we just share Jesus, how better the world would be. Will you join me?
in committing ourselves to the purpose that God has got us here. Will you join me in saying, let this church, let us be a church that seasons the world and shines like salt and light in this community that makes a difference. Oh, we don't have to beat people over the head with the gospel. We don't have to walk around with, but if we will show them Jesus and we will sow good seed about Jesus, he will bring increase and he will bring lives to Jesus and we will bring others to heaven with us. Will you stand with me a moment? Would you bow your head with me? Those of you that are watching online, please stay with us just for a moment or two as we close this service and as we pray, because this is an important time. Maybe there's somebody watching and maybe there's somebody in here today, you don't know Jesus. I would love to bring you to heaven with me. I'd love the privilege I've, to tell you about what Jesus has done in my life, how he's changed my life, and he's brought peace and hope and joy, and I can get up every day, even in the midst of a crazy world, and still know that I got hope in my life. If you don't have that today, I want to introduce you to Jesus, and I want to pray with you. If you're online or if you're in the building today with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, please, everyone praying. If you don't know Jesus today, let me have the privilege to pray with you and lead you into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ to begin a journey, a spiritual journey of hope in your life. Pray with me, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead. Therefore, I'm saved. I'm born again. I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. Lord, I accept this gift of salvation by faith, through grace, and I commit myself to this new spiritual journey of faith in you, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, put your hands together and make a joyful noise unto the Lord. If you prayed that prayer online or you prayed it here today, I'd love to talk with you. Reach out to us. Let us know. We want to help you. We'll get you a Bible. We'll help you in that journey. Take next steps to moving forward in that spiritual journey. How many believers we got in the room? Come on, wave at me. Come on, all over this place. Those of you online, wave at me. Let me know you're a believer. Listen, let's lift our hand toward heaven and say, Jesus, I commit myself. Jesus, I commit myself to the purpose of my life, to be a messenger of the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, wherever I go, whoever I meet, whatever opportunities you put in my path, help me to shine for Jesus, to plant seeds into good soil that'll bring a harvest of souls for the kingdom of God. Help me, Lord. Holy Spirit, empower me and use me to show extra kindness and extra boldness to make a difference with my life for Jesus. Amen. One more prayer I want us to pray. 